the University of Austin was announced this this week, uh, now six days ago, to um, some cheers, but a lot of cheers, and um, and I am cautiously optimistic that this really could be the institution that many of us have been have been waiting for. We, of course, have um, a lot to say about what higher ed can be and what it should not be. And, uh, and you know, we've, we've written some about this in various places. I'll be, again, writing more about it from my Substack on Tuesday. And, you know, one thing that I will, will say to start is that it is true that much of the, you know, the, the thing that catapulted us into the public eye, in part, was that uh, Evergreen blew up in the in the midst of a sort of a woke revolution, an ideology that affords no dissent and is not interested in um, you know, really pursuing uncomfortable truths very um, very effectively, if at all. In fact, um, some. Some believers in the ideology, the woke ideology, if you will, uh, actually dismiss ideas like merit and um, absolute um, truth, objective reality, uh, and and obviously a university that uh, in which that is that is happening is not going to be very effective at educating people. Nor is the research that takes place at such a university going to be um, necessarily the best research that could be happening. You know, some research programs may continue sort of under the radar of such a thing, but uh, many research programs um, won't. But um, that thing, that thing that is taking over universities in in very modern times, uh, could not have gotten gotten a hold if the universities weren't already weakened, right? So you know we we argue and have argued before and will continue to argue that the woke ideology is uh, needs to go. It, you know, no successful university can be intact with it in place. Um, but a university that is free of that um, will not necessarily free itself of all of the incentives, all of the perverse incentives that have rendered modern universities um, really out of touch with uh, what a, a pursuit of truth should be should engage with. Yeah, I, I would argue um, effectively this is an autoimmune disorder that made the universities vulnerable to wokeism. But what that implies is that if you rid yes. the, the the body ac academic of wokeism, you won't have cured the underlying disease and therefore it will be vulnerable to other ridiculous ideologies. And it will, uh, I think you've been gentle here. It's not that they're failing in their mission. They are actually engaged in the inverse of their mission. They're actively miseducating students. Mm -hmm. And there are lots of reasons that they might do that. But the, the basic point actually comes down to something that we've uh, said many times on Dark Horse, which is zero is a special number, mm -hmm. right? The idea that in a an era in which universities are actively miseducating their students, that there is not a single exception where those of us who find this absurd can send our kids is remarkable. Because certainly, even if you imagine that most people want this, which most people clearly don't, but even if you imagine, if you grant that most people want this change, there are a lot of us the, who are the alarmed. Work change. Right. Mm -hmm. There are a lot of us who are alarmed, who are now looking around saying, well, okay, we have uh, kids on the verge of college age. There's literally not a single place to send them. Yeah. I mean, people, um, former students with family members who are now trying to go to college um, and and perfect strangers as well, contact you and me both. Um, you know, generally, we get more than one question a week. And, you know, certainly I've gotten many, many of these of, of late saying, where where can I go? Where can I send my kids? Where can I send my cousin? You know, where, you know, what, given what you guys saw that was possible and were able to do at Evergreen, because Evergreen really was an extraordinary model that got captured, that got gamed. Where where can they go now? And for a couple of years, uh, you know, 20, end of 2017, 2018, one of the things I was saying to people was, well, it's, you know, it's, it's quite hard to get into, of course, but the University of Chicago with its you know, strong stand for freedom of inquiry and the so-called Chicago principles uh, does suggest that that is an institution that is going to resist this sea change. Uh, but, but no, you know, more modern evidence suggests the University of Chicago too is falling, you know, yes, giving further credence to your zero is a special number. It's falling slower than other institutions, but nonetheless, 
you know, the fact is in a market, it's not like only the majority gets catered to. And the fact that there's no institution that will deliver the good that so many of us are demanding. And also, of course, if you project forward, uh, college students who go to an institution that isn't actively miseducating them Mm -hmm. will also be presumably in high demand in a job market where people actually want stuff done. And so, you know, that university will rise through the ranks of all universities as its graduates go on to do important things and be recognized. So there is a huge mystery at the bottom of this, which is why do we not have at least a diversity of models uh, in competition with each other? Um, Right. Instead of instead of universities advertising to future students that they have resort like grounds and you know lazy rivers and such, um, as um, as is the case at, for instance, LSU, uh, we would be you know a university could advertise that yes, y- you will probably have fun here, but you will have fun because a life of the mind is extraordinarily exhilarating and joyous. And there you know yes, there are other ways to have fun as well, but. You know, ed- education, not indoctrination, and uh, and oh, by the way, you're going to be in high demand. So you know, this is uh, I I do not believe in the model of universities as a jobs program, right? right? As as you do not, um, but part of um, part of what students who are you know thinking about spending four years or more of their life somewhere need to consider is is this degree um, ridiculous? You know, will anyone take this seriously? Um, and indeed, will I be able to think better about the world on the other end of it? And all too often, um, the answer is no, right? <clears throat> and so one of the things that the University of Austin is going to try to do is um, stay away from a number of the sort of the, the funding traps um, that have limited what questions can be asked at other at other universities and it's it's tricky um, and it you know it involves you know there, there are a number of ways that once you are beholden to especially federal money then um, then they can change what it is that you do and how you do it and so everything from the giant grants, the NSF and NIH and DOD grants and such that um, faculty are encouraged to bring in, which then drives science faculty into further grant getting and drives other faculty too often grievance studies faculty into positions of prominence and governance, such that they are taking over the running of the university. Um, That's, you know, that's one problem. And then the fact that organizations, um, federal organizations like the National Science Foundation and the National Institutes of Health actually end up having say in what kinds of questions get answered by virtue of upregulating some kinds of research programs and driving extinct others. That's one problem. Uh, when you have, um, when you rely as a university on um, to get any sort of um, lower or lower middle income students in on um, under Pell Grants, um, then that's another um, way that universities have uh, that universities are beholden to the federal government and then of course accreditation and so you know the accreditation question is one that uh, maybe we'll save mostly for another time but if you if you decide that you do not want to be beholden to the accreditors you cannot you are not eligible for things like nsf and nih grants if you're faculty or pell grants if you're students Uh, but Likely, that freedom that you know that that obvious fiscal cost comes with a freedom that is perhaps actually necessary if you are to run a university that is actually able to engage in free inquiry at this point. Well, uh, so I want to point out um, you are uh, on the board of this uh, new effort. Mm-hmm. You and I spent a year on a project targeted at the same objective. Indeed, uh, more than that, 14 months, yeah. Um, the Beringia Project. And we that project is not dead, but we put it on permanent pause because we couldn't solve the question of how you get enough resources to bootstrap uh, a higher ed 2.0 institution yes. uh, to make it actually catalyze. And so in any case, we did a lot of thinking, though, in that 14 months about questions like accreditation. In fact, I believe that was our very first decision was that Mm -hmm. accreditation was the mechanism that causes zero to be the number of functional institutions. Mm -hmm. Therefore, it is a prerequisite to doing anything functional that you escape that. Um, and I'm very you escape accreditation. Yep. That you that you agree to pay the costs of not being accredited, and that actually you are likely to reap the benefits at the point that employers keep hiring 
people who have been turned numbskull by miseducation, yes. right? At the point that that pattern becomes obvious and there become a, a, su- a second type of applicant that doesn't have the degree from an accredited institution, but does have some degree from an institution that isn't, you know, in catastrophic freefall, right? At that point, then the system shifts and those employers will, out of self-interest, be seeking students who have this alternative, whatever it is. So anyway, that was our, our I believe, our first decision in the Berengia project. I believe um, so as well. And I hope that your project ends up picking some picking up some of the wisdom that we generated because i believe you know it has solved the problem we didn't solve right it It, seems to have figured out it is managing to attract um quite a lot of resources already needs more right yep and so in some sense you've got a question of how do you solve the build an institution Mm -hmm. question you need people who can figure out how to access the resources and then there's a question of what do you do with it and your point here i think is exactly the right one which is a non-woke institution is a prerequisite to a functional institution but it is not the institution you should be building if you're headed to to uh, academia 2.0 that's exactly right and yeah and really you know, one of the ways it, Evergreen was founded in the I always forget, like late sixties, early seventies. You know, and it like it like it all opened its, its doors in seventy two, right? But the founding yeah, it was a couple of years was, before yeah. that because that is always the case with new institutions. You sort of you know you say, okay, we're launching, but it's going to be a couple of years as we try to figure out exactly what we are. We collect the faculty, all of this, just like the University of Austin is planning. Um, and you know, some of some of the founding principles. Um, are unlike any uh, for Evergreen, are unlike any that are anywhere else. And the fact that Evergreen exploded so remarkably and publicly in 2017 does not reveal that those founding principles were flawed. What it reveals is that they were gameable, that they were capturable, and indeed that they got captured. Um, I, w- I would say something slightly different. Okay. Um, my sense and what I said when we were teaching there and had no idea that it was going to melt down. Right. Um, is that the founders? Until the last couple of years beforehand, the yeah. founders broke every rule on the book. Mm-hmm. Like literally, we didn't have departments, right? Yep. We didn't have tenure. We had things that stood in the place of these things. Well, we had at the very beginning. I'm not sure that there was either tenure or departments. By the time we got there, there was something that was exa- in fact a legal analog for tenure, yep. right? So you know, we can say we were tenured. Called conversion, right? But yes. my, my point is, yep. pick a rule that functions in a university. Yep. It was broken at Evergreen, right? Mm-hmm. Um, no faculty member outranked any other faculty member in a technical sense, although there were those who had this equivalent of tenure called conversion, yep. and there were those who didn't, and right. there were visitors. But, but the point is, they had neutralized faculty rank. You didn't have departments. You grouped by interest area. Mm-hmm. Um, and you could move around freely you between You could move them. around freely. Uh, I was in consciousness studies. In fact, I was the chair of consciousness studies for two years, I think. Um, but in any case, the... It's instantly hilarious to me that both you and I ended up chairing uh, these sort of, it's not departments, but these things that were, you know, fill in the blank studies, <laughs> given right. that so most of the, most of the fill in the blank studies fields are, you know, woo woo at best and, you know, and, and, and really quite terrible. But um, let me just, let's actually say just a few words about these for before consciousness studies, because that's going to just throw people completely. Um, environmental studies, which is the, um, whatever we called it, planning unit, something um, that we were in, and I was, I chaired it briefly before actually jumping ship into consciousness studies, was imagined as an actually, um, interdisciplinary, multidisciplinary uh, group of faculty, many of whom are natural scientists, like biologists and geologists, and some of whom are social scientists, like, um, you know, land planners and, um, and sociologists. Um, and it really did bring together a number of the, you know, of, of the of the interests that a person would have if they were trying to understand what the environment is and um, how it is that humans engage with it. Consciousness studies. So consciousness okay. studies was slightly mislabeled. Yes. Now, I do have a longstanding academic interest in consciousness, and I've written about it. So in some sense, even if the subject matter was consciousness, it might have been the right place for me. Mm-hmm. But what it really was, was faculty who were throwbacks to the initial vision of the college and were very involved in how to access the consciousness of students and grade exactly. it, right? So yes. it was basically a grouping of people that wasn't about subject matter. It was about academic approach, Yes, um, which was an interesting thing. So I would say the lack of departments at Evergreen was not 
a it was not simply correct and it was not simply a failure as a mixture but but the point i wanted to make is that the founders threw out every single normal structure right and they replaced it with something and half of the things they did were nonsense and didn't work and half of the things they did were brilliant and revealed things that you wouldn't know unless you ran the experiment mm -hmm. and the problem with evergreen is that it never went back and said all right which of the alternative structures that we have here actually proves that there was something useful to be done and which of them is hobbling. Mm -hmm. And so I would just point to this one, which always troubled me. Evergreen neutralized faculty rank, right? So no faculty member outranked any other faculty member. Mm -hmm. That actually worked surprisingly well at Evergreen, mm -hmm. right? The fact that every that nobody right. in a faculty meeting stood up and had more power than anybody else, that actually worked pretty well. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I was a very outspoken visitor at the, at the beginning of my uh, time teaching. That's shocking. But the point is, at a university where I was a, the lowest ranking person, right, right that would have been very dangerous and at probably wouldn't have worked out. At the point that you started, where at another institution you would have had the 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 title of lecturer or adjunct or something. Right. right. Yeah. So anyway, this is something that worked. On the other hand, it was absolutely crippling when you wanted to interact with people from other institutions, because since there was no faculty rank, what they supplanted that with was the term member of the faculty, which if you wrote a letter to the editor and you were a tenured for effectively tenured professor at Evergreen, but you had to say member of the faculty made you sound like the university hadn't even hired you with a ongoing contract. So it basically subordinated, subordinated you to the rest of the world. So anyway, that Which was a place the, where they made an error. And you know, it's, it, there is going to be a tension between those who recognize that, uh, that hierarchy is abused and in too many play, too ubiquitous. And those who think that no hierarchy, um, is is going to be a solution. I guess that's actually the same the same end of the spectrum. That yeah, you know, there was a, there was a move, there was a pendulum swing away from many of the overly hierarchical ways of doing things in the '60s and, and early '70s with, with Evergreen's origin. Um, but it 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 went too far, right? So I, I did want to actually the one thing I wanted to say about Evergreen's model was none of this, none of the no departments or faculty rank or or titles or anything, um, but something that we've talked about before, which was um, utterly extraordinary and exactly the thing that um, that an excellent undergraduate college education, I believe, can and should uh, in, engage itself with, which is full-time programs, which is the immersion of a group of students with one or more faculty in work that goes on for 10 weeks or 20 weeks or 30 weeks, you know, up to a full academic year, such that everyone actually gets to know one another. And you really do come to be in community with one another. And, you know, yes, a lot of these sort of, you know, modern pedagogy terms like learning community and, um, and such will, will sound will sound ridiculous to those who haven't been, you know, who haven't been swimming in these waters, but very quickly at Evergreen, I came to recognize how utterly necessary it was if you actually wanted to reach students who were coming, who were coming in with all sorts of both expectations and you know, when I say levels of preparedness, I don't mean that uh, I don't mean that we should always be able to reach people who have neither, you know, interest or ability, and those who have the most interest and ability. But because so much of K through twelve schooling is so bad and such a poor fit for some of the most brilliant people out there, we had students, and we also we had students who had been told throughout their formal schooling that they were stupid that they shouldn't go to college, that they, um, you know, needed to focus on work in the trades. And, you know, very often when I had students come to me from the trades who would say, oh, I can't do this. You know, I, I know I'm not really up to this. I'd say, you know, what have, what work have you been doing? You've been working with physical systems successfully, you know, as a forklift operator, as a carpenter, whatever. And, you know, if, if, if you've been doing that successfully, you haven't killed anyone, you, you know, you, the things that you're building aren't falling down, um, of course you have capacity. And you know, if you have been told that this kind of capacity that happens in an institution of higher ed is a fundamentally different kind of capacity than what you're doing, then you know, that's, that's on them, not on you. So, okay, you point to the full-time programs, and I think people really don't 
if unless you've been in the system as either student or professor, you really don't understand how radically different this is. Yeah. Professors teach one class full time. Students take one class full time and it can go on for a full year. So the level at which you know each other is remarkable. Yeah. The other thing, though, coupled with that was the freedom to teach yes. anything you wanted to teach in any way you wanted to teach so long as students showed up and were moderately happy. The freedom of choice and of inquiry for both faculty and students. Right. Now, the problem is that system is gameable, mm -hmm. right? Student uh, Professors who want to um, not teach mm -hmm. and be popular can do it in that structure. And Evergreen had no way of eliminating them. So you had lots of people hanging on to jobs that they weren't doing very well. Sure. Um, so the point is, how do you get the benefit of the full-time programs, which is amazing for anybody who wishes to figure out what's possible in a classroom, yeah. and the benefit of the freedom without paying the cost of lots of dead wood on the faculty? And, and so, so this is a place where if you took the lesson of what worked at Evergreen and the lesson of what didn't work, you could figure out what to do for a 2.0 institution.